This video demonstrates the microsurgical resection of a retrochiasmatic craniopharyngioma through a modified posterior petrosal approach. The patient was a 9-year-old male presenting a history of one year of progressive headache, evolving to nausea and vomiting in the last two weeks prior to admission and diplopia in the previous week. Upon admission, the patient presented also confused and drowsy. An urgent ventricular peritoneal shunt was performed in the admission due to an obstructive hydrocephalus caused by an intracranial mass first identified in this initial CT scan, and the patient presented an improvement of symptoms following this procedure. MRI depicted a large, solid cystic mass with major supracellar extensions with obliteration of the third ventricle and projections to the interpeduncular and prepontine cisterns. The lesion measures 4.5 by 3.6 by 3.3 cm in the greater axis, and we can observe a greater extension of the mass to the right side, and we notice that the lesion has more posterior and superior projections. And here we can better notice the peripheral enhancement after contrast administration, as well as a heterogeneous enhancement of a mural nodule located anteriorly and inferiorly. And by these comparative images, the extensions of the solid cystic mass are better demonstrated, as well the position of the mural nodule. And we can observe calcifications in the nodule seen by the CT scan. And here the cyst is better evaluated. Reviewing the vascular anatomy, an important finding is a fetal pattern of the right posterior cerebral artery. Another key point is the position of the anterior cerebral arteries. As they are not superiorly displaced and are close to its anatomical position, it suggests a retrochiasmatic lesion. The venous anatomy should be preoperatively evaluated. We cannot observe a major sigmoid sinus dominance, and it is also observed the temporal venous drainage pattern with a more prominent complex of the vein of Labe on the left, while on the right side a more important drainage towards centorium. During investigation, it was observed that important visual field compromised, and laboratory evaluation demonstrated no major disturbances. In this case, we preferred to perform the tumor resection to offer a definitive treatment and chose a posterior petrosal corridor to minimize the risk of injury to the perforator arteries arising from the anterior circulation, considering the retrochiasmatic projection of the tumor in this case. We present an alternative surgical option that can be used in these cases and must be kept in the surgeon armamentarium. Considering the side with the major projection of the mass and no marked sigmoid sinus dominance, the right side was chosen. It is important also to mention the posterior cerebral artery to be in evidence in the surgical field. Following proper evaluation, microsurgical resection was indicated, and here we point some risks and benefits of the procedure. In this case, a posterior petrosal approach will be employed considering the retrochiasmatic location of the tumor. A transcalosal corridor was avoided considering the major superior extension of the mass towards third ventricle, adding the risk of hypothalamic involvement and injury during the surgical access to the cyst. A subfrontal and pterional approaches were not chosen as the tumor was located more posteriorly than usual, with the risk of injury to the perforator arteries in the course towards the retrochiasmatic lesion, which has the potential to cause hypothalamic dysfunction. The endoscopic endonasal approach may be an option in this case, as this is a big mass with potential risk for postoperative pituitary or hypothalamic dysfunction, as well as eventually the pituitary stalk may be infiltrated, considering the suspicion of, of a craniopharyngioma. Maneuvers like the pituitary transposition or even stalk sectioning would be potentially possible to be performed to improve exposure. Also, it could allow better visualization of the hypothalamus borders to facilitate the dissection. However, the important superior projection may be also difficult. It. There are no perforators in fact between the surgeon and the tumor by this route. The superior hypophyseal arteries are in the chiasmatic cistern, usually anterolateral to the mass and may be displaced laterally. Other alternatives to be considered to try minimizing endocrinological disturbances that could be considered are the cyst fenestration and aspiration with resection of the solid component, what would delay a definitive treatment. Or else it could be inserted a catheter into the cyst with an Omaya reservoir to administer cycles of interferon alpha, what could shrink the lesion and control it, or even delay a definitive treatment, however there are still limited evidence. 
The patient is positioned supine with the head rotated to the contralateral side and the ipsilateral shoulder elevated. It is important to confirm no jugular vein compression and a modified arciform incision around the ear is performed to allow exposure since the mastoid to the temporal region. Following skin incision, the fascia of the temporalis muscle is dissected while the scap attached to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Here we have the bone exposure. We prefer to start with the mastoidectomy to first identify the sigmoid sinus and to perform the craniotomy following it. In this case, just the proximal part of the sigmoid sinus will be skeletonized, as we need just the room to slightly mobilize posteriorly the sinus and section the tentorium to increase the working corridor along the basal cisterns towards the lesion. Now we have the dural exposure and the dural incision is depicted, which is better demonstrated by this anatomical exposure. Initially, a small incision in the presigmoid dura is performed to drain some CSF. Next, the dural at the base of the temporal lobe is incised, as well as the presigmoid dural incision is enlarged to be connected with the temporal one, with coagulation and sectioning of the superior petrosal sinus between them. A small piece of cotton is placed underneath the temporal lobe to help enlarge the subtemporal corridor while tentorium is sectioned towards the incisura. Progressively, the tentorium is being cut, highlighting its posterior subtemporal pathway. And when the tentorium incision gets close to the incisura, the fourth nerve must be seen to allow the last cut to be safely performed. And here we can observe the preservation of the fourth nerve. Now we got direct access to the posterior wall of the cyst, which is initially drained to relieve its mass effect. And next, its capsule starts to be circumferentially dissected and peeled out from the surrounding structures, preserving arachnoid planes. The capsule is gradually circumferentially dissected, and at some points it should be incised to decompress the solid component related to the mural nodule. detachment of the capsule from the floor of the third ventricle, which is also preserved, as well as the ventricle decompressed. Here the inferior and then the anterior and superior projections of the mass are gradually dissected. As the cyst was drained at the beginning of the resection, it allowed for the decompression of the mass. Then a safer and more accurate circumferential dissection was possible to be performed. Following complete circumferential dissection of the capsule, preserving the arachnoid planes, an in-block resection was performed, and the whole capsule of the tumor was possible to be removed. It is interesting to comment the surgical corridor to be above the posterior cerebral artery and the fourth nerve. And by this view, we can observe the preservation of some of the perforating arteries arising from the carotid. Another key point of the posterior petrosal approach in this case is to provide different viewing angles. Now we inspect the surgical cavity, and here we have a global view depicting the surgical corridor. We inspect the surgical cavity with the endoscope with no residual tumor identified. We also highlight the preservation of the perforating arteries from the anterior circulation, as well as demonstrate the optic nerve, chiasm, and optic tract. Picom in its course to the posterior cerebral arteries depicted and also the third and fourth nerves. Skull base approaches demands meticulous closures that should be planned since the beginning. Here we can review some general key points of the craniopharyngiomas, and now some clinical highlights as well post-operative endocrinological details. Post-operative imaging demonstrated a complete tumor resection. And here we demonstrate preservation of the pituitary gland and stalk and see a comparative between pre- and post-op scans. Now it's possible to observe the surgical corridor and the patient presented with no neurological deficits on follow-up, as we can observe in these images from the first days following the procedure. Regarding the endocrinological function, the patient presented a triphasic manifestation of the diabetes insipidus on the first days following the surgery, demanding proper correction, however with progressive resolution and no need of desmopressin on discharge. In the follow-up, it was observed hypothyroidism and hypocortisolism, 
which started to be treated and a possible growth hormone deficiency associated 